He is worthy. Amen. Uh, he's worthy for you to be here today. He's worthy for you to sing praises to him. And he's worthy for uh, you to listen to his word of God preached this morning. Amen. This morning, I want to ask you, are you dressed for worship this morning? Do you have on a, a wardrobe of worship? Now, I'm not asking, do you have on a pair of shorts and flip-flops and a t-shirt? Or if you got on a, a, a suit and a tie and, and a new shoes. I'm not talking about your outward appearance. I'm talking about your inward attitude. Do you have a, a wardrobe of worship? Now, we're continuing our, our study of, of the tabernacle. We've looked at all the different furniture in the tabernacle. We've talked about the, the veil and, and so many different things. And now we're going to talk about the priest and the robe that the priest would wear when he would come into the, the tabernacle to, into the Holy of Holies to, to worship God. If you have your Bible, strength will to Exodus, the 28th chapter. Exodus chapter 28, we're going to be reading this morning verses 31 through verse 35. Exodus chapter 28, beginning in verse 31. And we see there's a spiritual application here between the, the robe that the priest would wear and, and the wardrobe of worship that you and I ought to be wearing. This is what it says in the beginning of verse 31. It says, And thou shalt make a robe of the ephod all blue, of uh, all of blue, and there shall be a hole in the top of it, in the midst thereof, and it shall have a, a binding of woven work round about the hole of it, as it were the hole of the, the haberdashon, uh, that it be not rent. Now, a haberdashon would be like a coat of mail. And so around the hole where the, the priest's head would go through, uh, it would be a, a woven work, and it would be a strong work, so there's no way that it would rip, no way that, that it would tear around the neck. And beneath upon the hem of it, thou shalt make pomegranates or, uh, of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and the bells of gold between them round about. And a gold bell and a pomegranate, a gold bell and a pomegranate, upon the hem of the robe round about. And so you've got a bell and you've got a pomegranate. You've got a bell and you've got a pomegranate all the way around uh, the bottom of that robe. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard when he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord. And when he cometh out, that he die not. Now if Aaron had the nerve to go into the holy of holies, not dressed properly, if he had the nerve to go into the Holy of Holies, not to wear what God said he was specifically uh, to wear, uh, he, he would die. Uh, he would not survive. He would be slain by God right there uh, in the Holy of Holies. Now, as we look at this, and I want to make some, some spiritual application here, that, that we need to understand that the high priest was a picture of Jesus, right? Uh, we've already talked about that. But we also have to understand that the high priest is also a picture of us. If you have been saved by the grace of God, the Bible teaches us that you are a priest, I want you to listen to what 1 Peter chapter 2, 9 says. But you are a chosen generation, listen, a royal priesthood. You know what? If you're saved today, the Lord has made you a priest. And just as Aaron went into the Holy of Holies, you, friend, can go into the Holy of Holies. As a matter of fact, I can go into the Holy of Holies. At 4.30 this morning, I had on a pair of house shoes, a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. And I went into the Holy of Holies. You say, preacher, listen, you weren't properly dressed. Yes, I was. Because it's not about outward appearance. It's about inward attitude. And I'm so glad I can tell you this morning, friend, that you can go into the Holy of Holies. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 23 says this. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Now, holiest there just simply means holy of holies. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. Hey, that's the only way. You cannot come any other way. By the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, you remember when Jesus died on the cross? And if you were here a few weeks ago when I, I preached on the veil, uh, when Jesus cried out, it is finished, and he died, when he gave up the ghost, what happened to the veil? It was torn in two, that's right, from the top down to the bottom. The barrier between us and God was totally removed when Jesus died upon the cross. And so we can go boldly into the Holy of Holies uh, through the veil, that is through Jesus' flesh, by his blood, it says, in verse 21 says, And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance, having faith, or excuse me, uh, full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. 
Hallelujah. Amen. We can go boldly into the Holy of Holies, just as Aaron did. Steve Howell, Al Cannon, Chris Shelton, and you can go into the Holy of Holies today. Amen. That was a good place to shout hallelujah. Amen. I mean, our God is an awesome God. Amen. Aaron, he, he would go to that, that brazen altar. At the brazen altar, he would collect the blood of a substitutionary sacrifice. He would go into the, that Holy of Holies and he would offer that blood there on the mercy seat. You and I can go into the Holy of Holies today simply because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Not because of who we are, not because of the clothes that we have on physically, but because of our attitude spiritually. If we know that the blood of Jesus Christ washes us and cleanses us and makes us righteous in the sight of God, praise the Lord, we can go into the Holy of Holies today. Now as we think about the, the robe that this priest would wear, that Aaron would wear, well, what are some spiritual applications that we can apply to, to your life and I can apply uh, to my life? Well, there's three things that, that I want us to talk about this morning. Number one, I want us to talk about our position, our position. And this robe teaches us something about our position. Secondly, about our profession. Uh, not, not what we do for a living and get paid for, but, but our profession for, from our mouth. And then thirdly, our possession. Uh, what do we possess because uh, uh, we have the robe of worship? Now, number one, let's talk about our, our position. Our position. Now Aaron was to wear a robe. And this robe was, was a blue robe and it was a beautiful robe. It, it was to have bells on it. It was to have pomegranates uh, all around about it on, on the bottom. Now this robe was made of linen. It was a, a blue linen robe that he was to wear into the Holy of Holies. Now if he didn't wear that blue linen robe into the Holy of Holies, he died. He fell dead. I mean the minute he went into the Holy of Holies, boom, his life would be over. He had to wear exactly what God said that he was to wear. And so he was to wear this, this linen robe. Now, why was it to be a, a linen robe? Well, the Bible teaches us why he had to wear linen. Look, if you will, in Ezekiel, uh, on the screen, Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 16 through verse 18. Ezekiel 44, 16 through verse 18. It says, They shall enter into my sanctuary, and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me. And they shall keep my, my charge... And it shall come to pass that when they enter in, enter in at the gates of the inner court, they shall be clothed, listen, with linen garments and no wool. And so Aaron couldn't wear a wool robe, no, no wool. Shall come upon them whilst they minister in the gates of the inner court and within. And they shall have linen bonnets upon their heads and shall have linen uh, breeches upon their, their loins. Now listen, they shall not excuse me, they shall not gird themselves with anything that causeth sweat. And so why was he to wear a, a cool, crisp, comfortable linen garment? He was not to sweat. And you say, well, what difference does that make if he, he was to sweat or not? Do you realize that sweat is a result of Adam's sin? Did you know that? Sweat is a result of Adam's sin. You remember Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, right? You remember God pronounced judgment upon Adam and, 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 and upon Eve and told them what they were going to, to face from now on because they sinned against God. I want you to look at what, what Genesis chapter 3 verse 19 says. In Genesis 3 19 it says, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. After Adam sinned against God from that day forth, when he would work, when he would put forth that human effort, he would have sweat come to his brow. Now, sweat, that represents for you and me, it represents human effort, human effort. When I work in my yard, I cut my grass, I weed eat my, my lawn, it's hot outside, what happens? I sweat, that's right. But my human effort produces sweat. And so God says, listen, when you come into the Holy of Holies, you wear linen, don't wear wool, don't wear anything that will make you sweat because sweat represents human effort effort. Now, what I want you to understand is when we come into the presence of God, it's not about us giving God our human efforts. It's not about offering God sweat. It's about resting. It's about ceasing from our human efforts and resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10, listen to what it says. Now, God says don't, don't sweat it. Listen to what he says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. 
And so when you enter into to rest, you cease from your own human effort, from your own human work. God doesn't want your sweat. The only thing that satisfies God is the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't bring sweat, you bring the blood of Jesus. Now, Ephesians chapter 2, verse, verse 8 and 9, listen to what it says. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. What's a gift? Do you work for a gift? You know, God gives it to you, right? And you just receive it. Now, it's not your gift until you receive it. And so we are saved by, by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves, not of your work, not of your sweat, not of your effort. And then he says, not of works, lest any man should boast. So how do we enter into the presence of God? By, by our human effort? By sweating and toiling and working and laboring, hoping that God would accept what we've done? No. We enter into his presence based on what Jesus has already done. We cease from our own labor and our own work, and we rest in Christ Jesus. Now, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul ties this all together for us. You see, what we have to understand that, that Jesus died for us. He died for us that he might give himself to us. He died for us so he might give himself to us so that he might do something through us. Amen? That's what he did. He died for us to give himself to us that he might do something through us. And that's what Paul says in Galatians 2.20. He, he says, I am crucified with Christ. But what he's saying there is that I'm dead. Hey, do dead folks sweat? Do dead people sweat? He said, I'm dead. Do dead people work? Do dead people labor? He says, no, I, I, I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live. He says, I am a dead man walking. That's what he's saying right there. I'm a dead man walking, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Praise the Lord. What, what Paul is saying right there, he understands that, that God wants Steve Howell to stop sweating and just rest in the finished work of Jesus. He doesn't want my sweat. Now listen, you go out here and you ask folks, <clears throat> excuse me, you ask people, say, are you going to heaven? A lot of people will tell you yes, won't they? Then you ask them this, why are you going to heaven? You know what eight out of ten of them will tell you? Well, I'm working really hard to get there. I'm doing the best I can. You know what they're saying? I'm offering God sweat. I'm giving God my human effort. You know what's going to happen? When they get there and say, God, here's my sweat, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Cast that one where there's wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth. But Lord, I, I did this in your name and I did that in your name. I cast out demons in your name. He'll say, I never knew you. It's not about your sweat. It's not about your human effort. It's about resting in what Jesus has already done. It's all about the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen, I feel sorry for folks that, that, are, that are trying. That are trying and, and they ought to be trusting. They're sweating and they ought to just be resting in what Jesus has already done. When he died on the cross, he said, it is what? finished. It's paid in full. I've done it all. You don't have to do anything. You just receive the gift. Isn't our Lord a wonderful Lord? <laughs> and so if you're going to worship God today, if you're going to go into the Holy of Holies, you have to understand your position this morning. You don't bring God your sweat. You come by the blood of Jesus Christ. You rest in His finished work. And so do you have the, a wardrobe of worship this morning? Not if you bring Him sweat. You've got to have that linen on. You've got to be cool. And you come resting in the, the work that Jesus has already done. And so there, there's position there. But the second thing I want you to see here is profession. Now the robe made of linen represents our, our position in Christ. Now the profession here represents, or is represented by, by the bells that would be on the bottom of, of the priest's robe. Now listen to what it, what it says here in verse 34. It says, a golden bell and a pomegranate 
a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of the robe round about. And so you got a bell and you got a pomegranate. You got a bell and you got a pomegranate all the way around the bottom of this robe. Look at verse 35. And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, and his sound shall be heard. What sound? The ringing of the bells. The ringing of the bells. That's, that is what will be heard. When he goeth in unto the holy place before the Lord, and when he uh, cometh out, that he die not. Now, that's an amazing thing here. He had to be dressed in linen, or he would die. The bells had to be ringing, or he would die. What, what people would do is they would gather around the, the Holy of Holies on the outside in the outer court. And as Aaron would go in with, with that blood from that sacrificial sacrifice, they would listen. And they were listening for the sound of those bells. If they heard the sounds of those bells, they knew that God was satisfied with Aaron coming to the Holy of Holies. If all of a sudden they didn't hear the sound of the bells, what happened? Aaron was dead. God, God didn't accept Aaron's worship. Now, now the linen robe has to do with our position. We are resting in the finished work of Jesus. The bells represent our profession of faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you rest in the finished work of Jesus, the very next thing to prove that you are resting in the finished work of Jesus is you make a public profession of faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. That's making noise, right? That's sounding out. You confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, now what does that mean? That means that if you do not profess Christ publicly, you do not have Bible faith. Faith that does not lead to a public profession of faith will not lead to heaven. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and 33. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whoso shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. You know what Jesus is saying? If you don't ring the bells for me down here, I'm not going to ring the bells for you up there. Amen. Jesus also said in Mark chapter 8, verse 38. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in glory, when he cometh in the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Friend, don't fool yourself today. Don't fool yourself. Thinking that you can sit there thinking that you're saved. But you say, well, listen, I'm not going to make it public. I'm not going to tell anybody about it. Jesus says, if you deny me, I'll deny you. If you confess me, I'll confess you. And if you ring the bells for me down here, I'll ring the bells for you up there. If you don't ring the bells, when you stand before God, no life. Just death. Now, if you don't have a robe, no need to ring the bells. Amen. If you're not resting in the finished work of Jesus, no need to make a public profession of faith because it's not real. It's not real. You see, there are a lot of people that are mouth professors. <laughs> they say that they're saved, but they're not heart possessors. They're not resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if you're not resting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, you don't have the robe of righteousness on, so no need to ring the bells. But there are a lot of bell ringers, but they don't have the robe. You've got to begin with the robe, amen? And then... You ring the bells. The Bible says in James chapter 2, uh, verse 26. Now, 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 to understand, I know you're not saved by walking down an aisle. I know you're not saved by taking the preacher by the hand. I know you're not saved by them giving you a card and you, you filling out that card. That's not, not how you're saved. I know you're saved by grace through faith. I understand that. But I also know the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 26, that faith without works is dead. Faith without works is what? You know what that means? It's not real. <laughs> It's not living faith. It's not a faith that's going to take you to heaven. And, and so you can sit here this morning and, and say 
in your heart that you're saved, but if you're not willing to make a public profession of faith, Jesus says that you're not saved. If you're ashamed of me, Jesus says, I'm going to be ashamed of you. You deny me, I will deny you. If you confess me, I will confess you. Romans 10.10 10 again. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. If you're saved, you ought to say so. You ought to say so. I have never known a true, genuine Christian that was ashamed of Jesus. That was not willing to make a public profession that Jesus was his Lord and his Savior. And I'm not just talking about at church either. I'm talking about at school, at work, at the restaurant, at the store, in the hospital, at the nursing home, wherever they might be. We have to stand up and testify for the Lord Jesus. Amen. Profession without belief. Profession without belief makes you a hypocrite. If you say it with your mouth but you don't have it in your heart, that makes you a hypocrite. Profession without belief, belief makes you a hypocrite. Belief without profession makes you a coward. To say that you believe it in your heart but not willing to profess it publicly makes you a coward. But belief and profession, hey, that makes you a Christian. And so we see that the road teaches us something about our position, resting in the finished work of Jesus. The bells teach us something about, about our profession. We ought to be ringing the bells for Jesus if we've been saved by the grace of God. But then there's fruit also in here, the pomegranate, and that tells us something about, about our possession. Notice if you would verse 33. Verse 33. We ought to be reproducing fruit. Verse 33 says this, And beneath upon the hem of it thou shalt make pomegranates of blue and of purple and of scarlet round about the hem thereof, and bells of gold uh, between uh, round about. Now, God says there's to be a balance. There's a bell, a pomegranate. Bell, a pomegranate. Bell, a pomegranate. I mean, all, all the way around. Uh, there's to be a, a balance. The bell has to do with our, our profession of faith in Jesus. Telling folks about Jesus. Testifying about Jesus. The fruit has to do with us bearing fruit. The, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, when you really and truly give your life to Christ, you rest in the finished work of Jesus, there's two distinct manifestations that's going to take place. One has to do with, with your profession, your testimony. The other has to do with your fruit, and that is being filled with the Spirit and producing the spiritual fruit that God intends for you to produce. Now, I want you to look, if you would, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23, our, our verses for this week. Now, if you don't have the robe, you're not ready to worship. If you don't have the bells, you're not ready to worship. If you don't have the fruit, you're not ready to worship. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and verse 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Now, don't you know something very important here? It doesn't say, but the fruits of the Spirit are, does it? This is one fruit. Now, a lot of people miss that. And some people will read this and they'll say, well, there's nine fruits of the Spirit. And they'll say, well, let's see, here's love. Yeah, I've, I've, got, I've got that fruit. Here's joy. I, I've got that fruit. Here's peace. No. I don't have that fruit. Long-suffering, no, I don't have that one. Gentleness, yeah, I, I've got gentleness. That, that's one of my fruits. Goodness, well, well yeah, I, I have goodness. Faith, yes, I, I've got faith. But, but I, I don't have meekness and, and I don't have, have temperance. Listen, if that's how you read this verse, then you don't understand this verse at all. This is not nine fruits. Does it say the fruits of the Spirit are? Is it plural? No, it's all singular, right? The fruit of the Spirit is. This is one fruit, but it has nine characteristics. One fruit, but nine flavors, if you will. Now, don't get the, the gifts of the Spirit 
mixed up with the fruits of the Spirit. Now, now when you read about the gifts of the Spirit, it will say that, that God gave to one the spirit of ministry. God gave to another the spirit of, of miracles. God gave to, to another a, a, a spirit of this and a spirit of, of that. Now, don't misunderstand the, the gifts of the Spirit with the fruit of the Spirit. Never do you read in the Bible where it says God gave to one the fruit of love. God gave to another the fruit of joy. God gave to another the fruit of peace. It, it doesn't say that. It says that, that, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. If you don't have them all, then you're not ready to worship because this is one spiritual fruit. Now, how do you reproduce this fruit in your life? Well, you don't sweat to do it, amen? <laughs> what sweat represent? Your human work, that's right, your human effort. So, so how do you produce this fruit? Well, you read John chapter 15. Jesus tells you how. Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, Jesus said, shall bear much fruit. So where does the fruit come from? Being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, you live, but it's not you. It's Christ that's living through you. As you abide in him, then the power of God flows through you and produces all, all of this fruit in your life. This one fruit with all of these flavors in it is in your life. Now, you have to be very careful here because there's some people that like to ring the bell. They like to ring the bell. They like to tell everybody, listen, that they ought to be saved. I, I had a, a guy a few weeks ago, he was talking about somebody witnessing to him saying, listen, uh, you, you ought to give your life to Christ and all this stuff. And he, he said he, he knew this guy. And when he said it, he, he told him, he said, listen, I know what you do. Here, here he was ringing the bell, but he wasn't producing any fruit. And so what did this guy say? I don't want to listen to what you've got to say. Then there are other folks that are, are bearing fruit, but they're not ringing the bell. In other words, they say, well, you know, Brother Steve, what I really believe is that, that I, I just go to work and I just live my life before them. And they'll see the Christian life. And as they look at my life, then they'll want to be saved. Hey, folks are not saved by your life. They're saved by Jesus' death. And if people look at your life and you're not telling them why that fruit of the Spirit is in your life, you know who's getting the glory? You are. You're getting the glory. Because you're not telling them, hey, it has nothing to do with me. Listen, let me tell you why that love and joy and peace and, and long suffering is in my life. It's because of Jesus. That's why. And then who gets the glory? Jesus does. Listen, I learned a long time ago. A long time ago. And I wish I'd learned it a lot sooner. That if there's any good that I do, it's not me that did it. Jesus did it. If there's anything that takes place in my life that's not good, you know who gets the blame? I do. <laughs> because Jesus doesn't make mistakes. And so when the praise comes, what do I have to do? I have to get out of the way and pass it right on to Jesus. <laughs> because it's Jesus the one that's done it. And so just don't be a bell ringer and just don't be a fruit bearer. If you're going to come into the presence of the Holy of Holies, into the presence of God, you've got to understand that Jesus has made you a royal priesthood. He's given you a position. That position is about resting. You rest in the finished work of Jesus. Don't offer him sweat. He will not take it. It's about the blood of Jesus. Also, there, there's profession. That's ringing the bells. You got to be ringing. <laughs> you got to say, not only do I rest in Jesus, but let me tell you, Jesus is, is the one that I confess to you as my Lord and as my Savior. Have you done that? Are you resting in the finished work of Jesus this morning? Have you made a public profession of faith in Jesus? And then, there's possession. Do you possess the fruit of the Spirit? Are you reproducing that fruit in your life? Not because you're trying and toiling and working and laboring. You're just abiding in Jesus. As you abide in Jesus, that fruit just naturally reproduces in your life. And so I ask you what I asked you at the beginning. Are you dressed for worship this morning? Do you really have the wardrobe of worship? Would you stand with me? Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, that, God, we don't depend upon our, our human effort, Lord, to be saved. 
But God, we depend upon the finished work of Jesus upon Calvary, Lord. God, I thank you, Lord, that you give us an opportunity to profess you, Lord, and uh, Lord, to, to stand for you and to not be ashamed of you, Lord. God, I thank you too, Lord, that you uh, provide everything that we need to produce the fruit and the, the, the peace, the, the happiness, the joy, the, the love, Lord, that needs to be produced in our lives. God, we thank you, Lord, that's all about just resting in you. And Father, I pray if there's anyone here this morning, Lord, that's never uh, arrested in your finished work, that today would be the day they'd give their all to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. We thank you for this message you've sent our way today. And Father, we just uh, thank you for all the blessings you, you allow us to enjoy each day. We ask that you'd bless each family and each home that's represented here today, Father, and be with our offering and be with the gift and be with the giver. And may it be used to, uh, to spread your word in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>